gave my talk for me and I'll sit down and you guys can imagine what I was going to say. Um, so I am, it's actually what I'm going to do is sort of a mixture of modeling stuff but also a fair bit of remote sensing uh, trying to look at s these aspects. And so, you know, Jim did talk about the iron limitation patterns and Dennis touched on those. And of course, Mike uh, really went into the IOD, which is good because that helps me not have to spend too much time reminding us what that is. And then the monsoon climate connection um, is actually something I sort of picked up and I'll get into that. Um, and Jim sort of briefly touched on that in a way. Uh, so a little bit of an outline, I'll sort of run through that forcing and biological response sort of background and what is the monsoon doing the Indian Ocean. Uh, look at Indian, iron limitation signatures in the Indian Ocean, so not just the Arabian Sea, but also sort of more across the basin. Impact of IOD on uh, patterns of biogeochemical variability. And look at this sort of climate signal in summer monsoon intensity and examine that with uh, sort of longer time series at our, um, at our fingertips now and then sort of talk about some of the implications to wrap it up. Um, so we've already seen sort of what the monsoon looks like. And so this is sort of a figure where what I've got here is the wind patterns and the associated Ekman uh, responses. And so you can see, um, you know, particularly, so up here is the winter monsoon. So that, that's that cool dry air coming down off of the Tibetan Plateau and across the Arabian Sea. And it's uh, driving mixing and convective mixing, as Dennis discussed. But also, there's a bit of a downwelling aspect to it from the curl. And then for the summer monsoon, you've got the Findlater jet sort of screaming through here, driving that strong coastal upwelling signature. But also, it does actually have an offshore pumping uh, downwelling aspect to it. And then you've got these sort of inner monsoons where they're, it's relatively quiescent and makes it for happy ship people out there on the water. Um, and so this is one of the kind of the seminal figures coming out of a Schott and McCreary overview paper. And this just really drives home the contrast between that monsoon forcing and how it affects the boundary currents. And Raleigh's going to really get into this. But uh, so you can really see sort of the Somali current basically shifts direction from here Along the Somali coast, it's going sort of that southwestward direction. Here during the summer monsoon, it's flowing up northeast. Um, you start setting up these things. So the southern gyre is this guy, the Great Whirl. Um, I think someone mentioned earlier, and that's a really big circulation pattern that sets up right off that sort of northern part of Africa. And there's a big upwelling wedge here, which is indicated by this little blue thing. And so um, that's really a dominant feature. And then you've got this sort of, it's a little bit uh, convoluted. I mean, not like a strict current, but there's sort of a progression across, so along the Arabian Peninsula. And there's this Ras al Hud jet that sort of pops off the end, um, off the Omani coast. And then you've got these monsoonal currents, sort of summer monsoon traveling Arabian Sea into the Bay of Bengal, and it flips around winter monsoon from Bay of Bengal into the Arabian Sea. <clears throat> and so those are all set up by this monsoon forcing. And here is sort of the biological response in, the, in terms of surface uh, chlorophyll coming from, uh, this is a modus climatology. And so you can see this is January up here. This is August. So you've got winter and summer monsoon. You've got high production you know, responses a little bit of a you know sort of lingering upwelling response here and up in April. So this is fall inner monsoon and the spring inner monsoon you can see things really sort of quiet down. And you can also see this sort of SCTR feature that um, Mike touched on, that sort of high relatively high, especially for this southern basin um, feature there. Okay, so <clears throat> as um, Jim mentioned uh, around the time of this, so this is coming out of the JGOFs and into the JGOF synthesis and modeling, that SMP program. Um, I was working on an Indian Ocean model, and it had iron as one of the explicit components. But so this is this quote that Jim refer referenced before from Sharon Smith, 
So if you look at this map, this is a global de uh, dust deposition pattern uh, produced by Natalie Moholwald. Um, and you can see, looking right here, why would anyone ever expect an iron limitation to set up in the Arabian Sea is, is like, that's crazy talk, you know? So this is this quote, I believe where it comes from is one of the planning reports for the Arabian Sea Jagoffs. Uh, I didn't actually track it down, but that's my best guess. So hopefully someday I can actually find it. So this, this um, graphic is showing what that model I was working on does in terms of contrasting. So the red is iron replete and the sort of dark blues is where it's indicating iron limitation in the model. So we're running a basin model of Indian Ocean um, with a coupled ecosystem. And you can see in sort of these upwelling regions, even in this is uh, sort of the winter time, but particularly in that summer monsoon time, this sort of feature here is indicative in this model of um, <clears throat> iron limitation being a uh, sort of the driver on production. And pretty consistently across the southern Indian Ocean, you can see that it's indicating um, iron limitation. So um, what was also kind of nice, uh, Mike Berenfeld was working on this sort of modus based using the fluorescent line height band that was available on this one, which wasn't on CWIFs. He developed these maps of phytoplankton um, fluorescence, um, you know, satellite-based. So you've got this map here, which, and, and sort of looking globally, they had this sort of 1.4% cutoff. If you start getting red on this scale, that's indicating nutrient stress. <clears throat> um, and if you look at this pattern, and this is sort of the same time frame, June to August, sort of averaged picture from the Wigger, our, our, our model, you get really kind of a nice spatial um, coherence here. So that was kind of a nice result. Um, <clears throat> so an interesting thing in, in that same Berenfeld paper from uh, 2009, he's now looking at the global map and looking at more at all global model output. And they, you know, they pick up nicely this sort of what's going on in the Pacific. But you can, and you can see here, so these are two slightly different time frames than I just showed, but they've still got in the Indian Ocean in, in the satellite-based map, this sort of nutrient stress indicator, and there is no sort of indication really here of nutrient stress being an issue. So that's one model, so they're not agreeing with each other. This is another model. This is uh, work from Kone and uh, Marina, Levy's actually here, so she's one of the co-authors on this work. This is running the Piscus model in, in, um, from the ocean. And they did, this really, they did this really nice graphic, which I really like. Uh, so this is sort of showing trade, you know, sort of a, a mapping of which is sort of the limiting variable. And so you got Southwest Monsoon, Northeast Monsoon. And you can kind of see the yellowish stuff is getting in towards iron, the sort of pinkish stuff here is silicate, and the bluish stuff is, is N, limited. And you can sort of see here along the Oman, you know, the Arabian Peninsula, they're more suggesting it's either sort of a silica, nitrogen, co-limitation story. Um, <clears throat> and so, if just to sort of summarize this model guidance, um, and this gives you a little brief synopsis of what's in these models. So the one thing you'll notice, in our thing we just had nitrate, ammonium, iron. Uh, more had more uh, variables as did the Kone et al. model. Um, and so what we're showing is Western Arabian Sea um, builds up that iron limitation. In more they really don't see um, that. They see some N limited but there's also sort of these other aspects that come into play, and they had a diazotroph, so there's also some indication of phosphorus limitation. And then Kone's got sort of this co-limiting component in the Omani upwelling of SI to N. Uh, <clears throat> so now to step back and, and sort of, I guess, give a short version of what Jim showed us. 
Um, so this is uh, data from that uh, Jagoff's Arabian Sea process study. Um, so this station right by the coast, and you can see here is the profile. This is measures, you know, the iron data that Chris measures and, and, and Vink were doing. So this is the profile in NFE ratio space, and this is actual DFE, the dissolved iron profile. So you can see it is shallow, and as Jim mentioned, it's a very narrow shelf. There is a little bit of an indication down here of kind of a, a link to the benthos in terms of a re, you know, remineralization coming in to the bottom water. But if you look at this profile in NFE ratio space, this whole range here, which I've sort of turned into a maroon box, this is in, in, that, in, that, in that ratio, that's indicating that it's prone to iron limitation. And so what the model that we ran was doing was basically re reflecting this. Um, and so just as, as Dennis mentioned, there's a sort of difference between um, earlier and later in the southwest monsoon. This is the latter part of the southwest monsoon. It's that TNO 50 cruise. So that's one little nugget. Um, this is a graph. This graphic is out of a NACV et al. paper. Um, and what they're doing here, so Jim mentioned that uh, Bruland work off the coast of California and the upwelling system. And these cases, one, two, and three, are so these are you know drawdown experiments. And what they're showing is what's going to happen is you run out of iron and nitrate is still there. And these two um, data points here are data points from the uh, Arabian Sea cruise that Waji and Jim were participating on. And these data points are sort of reflecting this same scenario where the what's going to run out first is the iron. <clears throat> and that station 16 here is very near that S1 coastal station that I highlighted in the previous slide. Um, okay, and so the last bit is something from Jim's recent paper, and the only thing I would really want to touch on here is this um, iron limitation index, which is listed in this table, and I've sort of highlighted three locations here where that iron limitation index is sort of less than 1.3, and one as you get above one, that's more and more you're getting into iron limitation. So all of these other stations are above 1.3. So they're suggesting, or the indication is, that these are iron limited um, waters. And this, again, is sort of in that uh, late monsoon time frame um, for the summer. So the summary here of this story is the models disagree. Um, the mechanism that was operating in that Wigert model is that the NFE ratio in the coastal upwell of waters is sort of at this 15,000 or, or above, suggesting it's prone to iron limitation. Um, the models that include broader set of nutrients suggest some complex co-limitation pattern among iron, um, nitrogen forms, silica, and phosphate. Um, observational evidence is sort of growing that during the summertime, especially waters upwelled in the Western Arabian Sea, and within offshore propagating filaments are inherently prone to limitation. And this is despite, obviously, that heavy dust deposition loading, um, potential sort of benthic remineralization aspects, and the open o OMZ, which Jim talked about quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> OK, there is also, uh, I didn't t really go through it here, but the models also disagree on iron limitation plays a role in the southern tropical Indian Ocean. I didn't really touch much on the Kone, but they, they do pick up um, iron limitation off of Africa and then sort of an FEN co-limitation across the basin during the southwest monsoon. And then there's no limitation across the S southern tropical Indian Ocean into the winter monsoon. But in our Wigert model, there's year-round this iron limitation pattern. And the patterns line up very nicely with that um, modus um, our satellite based fluorescence distribution of um, nutrient stress. Okay, so uh, this is just a quick, I'm not going to get into this. So, this is basically to remind you about the Indian Ocean dipole, um, and Mike talked about that quite extensively. So, basically, what happens, you have anomalous upwelling 
setting up off Indonesia and sort of a more of a downwelling or convergence signal on the on the west side. Um, okay, so the and we actually had that question before. This is dipole mode index in the blue and Nino 3.4 in the red. This is that 97, 98 time frame. So what was really nice, and we saw that pic that image before, which I'm going to show you again, about that early um, IOD event, which is a kind of a monster, had a really strong signature in the chlorophyll. And then what I'm going to do is also do a little bit of contrasting with this 0607 event. <clears throat> so this is that graphic Mike showed before. So you get this really strong sort of upwelled water and it's extending basically halfway across the basin. And you've also got this signature showing up in the southeast Bay, Bay of Bengal. And the more typical pattern is it's very oligotrophic everywhere. Um, and as Mike also talked about, the tuna fishery s sort of swung all the way over to the east during this time because that's where the forge was, and that's where the tuna were setting up. So, um, so now this is looking at um, Hofmuller's uh, along 8th south, so that's in the southern, along the equator, and at 6th north, sort of going across that Bay of Bengal over to the Arabian Sea side. So this is um, sea level. And this is chlorophyll. And so this thing to see is sort of recognized down here. This is the 97, 98 event. So you've got negative sea level anomaly setting up on the east side, strong positive on the west. And you've got sort of associated with it is a, strong, a positive chlorophyll anomaly. It gets really pronounced here along the equator. And you also see it here up in 6 north. And it has this suggestion of propagation that it's sort of associated with planetary waves. <clears throat> and in contrast, this 067 time frame, you can see a pretty good response here. So this IOD was in, in 8 south was pretty pronounced. Um, the chlorophyll is little, has also got that bump. And then what happens actually here on the equator, which is sort of right where the sweet spot of this thing's setting up, is it sort of takes off and then right at the beginning of 2007, it it shuts down, and that's because basically the forcing um, basically stopped being so anomalous and, and dampened the whole thing out. Um, and so I just wanted to make a couple, I want to kind of get through this piece. So these are um, basically postage stamps, October of 97 through January 98 for uh, chlorophyll anomaly. Here's the co corresponding time frames. So this is 97, 98, this is 06, 07. And the other thing we've done is brought in um, NPP calculated by the CP, CBPM um, model that uh, Berenfeld had all produced. And what we did here was actually turn this into anomalies to look at, you know, when you see this, how does it translate in production? And I'm just gonna show you that because I basically want to sort of put that nugget in your head and then I'm going to show you a table of how the IOD impact worked. <clears throat> uh, so this is getting into the mechanisms a little bit and why it was different. So this is looking at the December 97 versus December 06. So you can see the response here was really pronounced and we saw that before. 06, 07, it wasn't quite as strong right on the equator, had a little bit more of an, um, a signal into the sort of south of the equator, and it dampens out really fast. <clears throat> and the reason really, which is in this story here, is the zonal wind anomaly that's sort of driving this um, kind of turned off, and so what was really driving this upwelling got shut down. So I think I'm gonna skip that one. And there's a nice analysis here. Um, by Curie, who's working with uh, Jerome Villard. Um, and so what they did here was a 40-year run of a interannually forced biophysical model. And what they're showing here on the right-hand side is um, sort of a regression of IOD index with surface chlorophyll. On the left side is IOD with um, sort of aerial, or you know, integrated over the photic zone. And you can see this sort of strong 
relationship between IOD and surface chlorophyll, which isn't surprising. And the other thing which really sort of pops out of this analysis is sort of integrated over depth, you see that same kind of strong relationship, but you also see this negative uh, chlorophyll response in related to sort of these off equator waves propagating back to the east. And so that's kind of a neat uh, result, and I'm still sort of getting my head wrapped around it. <clears throat> uh, so this is the table I was referring to, and what I really only want you to see here, so this is looking at, so this is production based off of that Berenfeld model of NPP. Um, these are divided up by region, and then there's sort of climatological 9798 IOD, 0607 IOD. What I really want to focus on are these highlighted boxes here and looking at percent change by region. So one thing you can kind of see, Arabian Sea is inconsistent, so its response to IOD is sort of not really, that's not really certain how that works or if there is a strong linkage. But what you do see is, is really highlighted in the, in the equator. In the west, you get a real strong negative um, you know, reduction. In the east, you get a real strong amplification. <clears throat> But if you look at sort of the basin wide, the overall there's a zero, essentially zero sum. So what it really means is you're remapping things, but your overall impact um, essentially washes out. <clears throat> uh, so that's mostly what that's saying, talking about the redistribution of NPP, um, and that sort of basin wide doesn't really show huge or clear impact. And then sort of this redistribution, um, and, and I sort of skipped some of the mechanisms, but it's related to both the anomalous atmospheric forcing in a local sense and atypical work jet behavior in Rossby wave field in sort of remote forcing sense. So there's a couple of mechanisms associated with how this works. Um, and then this is that Curie result from how the model-based IOD response is apparent in aerial, in, I, um, chlorophyll in the south, in the SCTR, South Arabian Sea, that's that sort of off equator Rossby wave. And so the timing of these is indicative of Rossby wave association. So the last piece, um, I will have to rip through. <clears throat> so um, this is sort of the map of um, the OMZ from the uh, Jacobs time frame, if you look at this sort of dark black line, and this is a sort of an updated version um, from Rickson et al. So this first one is sort of for NACV, second one is, is Rickson, and you can see this sort of reddish line here, especially extending out here. And so it's indicating that over the, that 10-ish um, year time frame, there's been an expansion, and it's about 63% since the Jagos time frame. Another little bit of information is this sort of deoxygenization, deoxygenization of the Indian Ocean um, in general over that sort of 1960 to 2010. This is a, a synthesis of, from Strama. And so what I wanted to touch on is look re-examining sort of this uh, causal link that Joachim as reported, um, sort of global warming driving reduced snow cover, leading to stronger summer monsoon and higher chlorophyll, which is proxy for biomass and production. And the identified, so that's sort of that identified relationship. And this is looking at uh, the wind and chlorophyll in uh, sort of that early sea time timeframe and looking at snow cover, which is here. So this is sort of degree, decreased European snow, Eurasian snow cover, and the idea is that it's affecting the winds and therefore that's that, um, driving the upwelling. And so what I've done, there's a lot of stuff here, but what I want to focus on is I've sort of drawn in um, <clears throat> snow cover data that's available from Modus Terra and Modus Aqua, looking at just the Tibetan Plateau, and so what I'm gonna do is look at that and look at a longer time frame. So here's some um, sort of box definitions. 
we get at looking at a longer term time series, don't really see trends popping out. Most of the sort of large anomalies are in the West Arabian Sea box, except for this one. And this is sort of the typical um, seasonal cycle. <clears throat> and so what I want to show you, so one of the key things here, so this is upwelling index. Um, this is that, this, so this is the time frame of that GOES result. And you can see longer term, these um, sort of regression lines are, are sort of dampening down. So the question is whether that trend is persistent and it doesn't appear to be that it's maintaining. And so now I'm looking at um, sort of a July and September in the Western Arabian Sea. So you can see very clearly this sort of shorter term positive trend in both um, sort of time frames. But if you look longer term, it's um, less clear what's going on. And so <clears throat> if you look at this is that um, sort of snow cover. So between 08 and 09, there's about a, what is it, like a 50% increase. And that's these two points here. You can see there's some clear interannual variability, but there isn't really a trend. And here's that sort of European snow cover um, anomaly. And you can sort of see that decreasing trend here. Um, but in that time frame, it's a positive anomaly over the longer term. Um, <clears throat> and so the question really is, um, is there a trend in chlorophyll anomaly versus um, snow cover fraction? You can kind of see sort of a snow cover fraction and response, so these sort of blue dots plus that red one. So as snow cover fraction decreases, you get sort of an increase in chlorophyll. So that does seem to, to maintain. Um, and that's showing up here as well in the Western Arabian Sea. And the last little bit of evidence sort of looking at this is um, export production does, so this is sediment trap data up here, does seem to align with this monsoon um, rainfall index but SST and chlorophyll do not. So there's kind of a mixed bag of signals. And so the overall story is um, it doesn't look like there's a longer term trend now that we have a 17 year ocean color record, uh, but snow cover uh, reduction and chlorophyll enhancement does seem to work. And so monsoon strength to production does seem to work based on the um, particle flux. And so <clears throat> the last, sort of summary slide is just to look at all of these in terms of how they might be affecting basin deoxygenation. So you've got iron limitation in the Arabian Sea, and Jim actually talked about this quite a bit. Um, there is this sort of hypothesis about that summer, late summer monsoon time frame. You're actually shifting into an HNLC region, and that's something that Waji has sort of presented in a paper. And so if you've got dustier conditions under future climate, does that sort of relieve that in any way? That's kind of a throwing ideas around. And connectivity of Arabian Sea OMZ to iron availability and cycling and maintenance of um, evolution of OMZ. The frequency of IOD manifestation, which may be also something related to climate change. Um, if you've got more frequent um, manifestations that's going to affect export conditions in the eastern I.O. and could further the expansion of low oxygen regions over there. And finally, this sort of southwest monsoon intensification, stronger upwelling leads to increased production and export flux and could be increased delivery of organic matter offshore to OMZ. So there's a few things that are sort of open questions, and that's sort of what I'm throwing up here um, in need of attention. So, thanks. And that's all I've got. Perhaps we can take one quick question while we're swapping speakers. Mike?
This is This is too far forward. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I think probably spatial heterogeneity is the big thing here. Um, there is that the Oman upwelling region, I think it looks pretty clear, at least the models indicating that that is driving towards iron limitation, but that sort of you wrap around over sort of the north, it also is not indicating iron limitation. So it does look like, I mean, it's very really dynamic, as people have already mentioned, and so there's a big, a lot of questions in sort of a short, sort of a smaller spatial window that you could be asking, depending on where you are, how does the system work? Could be very different going from east to west. So, I mean, I think that's sort of where you're going, and I agree. I, I would yeah. like to add that there's a lot of spatial variability, and off the northern coast of Oman, there's no iron limitation. Even during the southwest monsoon of Ras al -Had, it happens off the southern coast. It's very clear in the observations that we have presented. 